Um, yep, so I'm going to be talking about uh, mediating pirate narratives through the, uh, the art of storytelling. Um, no, he's a pirate. Elizabeth Swan's words in the closing scene of Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl, invite an ambivalent response from the viewer. In this scene, the message is clear. Will Turner's piracy is honorable. Yet for the duration of the film's plot up to this point, pirates have been portrayed variously as comedic archetypes, a threat to both the economic and sexual security of the British Empire, and even a handful of racist stereotypes. This somewhat confused representation reveals a truth about pirate narratives that extends far beyond the early 21st century, all the way back to the much written about and oft romanticized golden age of piracy. Generally agreed to have taken place at the start of the 18th century, there are perhaps few other eras in history that can boast such a profound impact on the cultural landscape, particularly given that even the most generous estimates only have it lasting about 12 years, from 1714 to 1726. In the centuries between then and the release of Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean, there have been almost innumerable stories about or featuring pirates. Writing about theatre and literature in the 18th and 19th century, Frederick Berwick and Manishag Powell said that some implied law of plot and genre nonetheless demands that some main character at some point be threatened by pirates, probability and convenience be damned. As, in terms of examples, they give, there's no shortage considering, consider, for example, Robinson Crusoe, The Mysteries of Adolfo, Swiss Family Robinson, Gulliver's Travels, The Conscious Lovers, all of which feature pirates as, conven as convenient, pre-made plot devices. The historical reality for pirates, however, is far more complicated than a horde of unwashed, drunken, barely human caricatures. In this paper, I will argue that by reducing pirates to this, we rob narratives of their ability to, ex to speak to the experience of marginalized groups. I will also demonstrate that pirate narratives often not only ignore piracy's historical relationship to colonialism, but are actually used to actively divert attention away from our colonial past. In the majority of Western pirate narratives written between the end of the Golden Age and the contemporary era, the pirate is male, straight, and white. Often, he is from an economically privileged background too. Frequently, the protagonist of these stories comes from a typical colonial background, and they have a brush with piracy before returning to the law-abiding ways of the empire by the end of the narrative, avoiding the hangman's noose. The reality, however, is that real pirates were most often those who had been wronged by the empire. They were mostly from the British Merchant Navy, under whom conditions were awful, pay was frequently reduced or withheld at the whim of tyrannical captains, and when complaints were brought to the attention of the law, they were frequently ignored. There were even a number of pirates who were escaped or freed slaves, including what Marcus Redeker refers to as at least one entirely mulatto band of sailors, causing terror off the Caribbean shores, as reported by the Boston Globe. Perhaps the most famous pirate novel of all time is Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, but Stevenson was, of course, by no means the first writer to use pirates. Adam notes that Treasure Island participates in a tradition of representing pirate, historical and fictional pirates, which extends as far back as the 17th and 18th centuries golden age of piracy. By the late 19th century, we can already see the pirate becoming nothing more than a handful of stereotypes. Their language, for example, is entirely nautical. They are, as Cohen points out, so bereft of any other frame of reference from which to draw their comparison that the effect of their figurative language is comical. Even on land, Billy Bones refers to everyone as mate and his lodging as a berth. In Treasure Island, the actions of the pirates are all seen as villainous, morally reprehensible, and without conscience, in contrast to the actions of Jim and his compatriots. Yet Jim betrays his allies by abandoning them, abandoning them at the stockade, shoots Israel hands, and perhaps most importantly, has no qualms about helping himself to a share of the treasure at the end, all of which would seem to place him squarely on the side of the pirates. As discussed above, however, he is allowed to return to his previous way of life after this brush with piracy and is in fact rewarded for it. Moreover, the eponymous treasure, which at first glance seems harmless, hides a much more insidious truth. It is the product of empire. Prominent naval historian David Cordingly writes that in the 1570s, twice a year, a fleet of Spanish galleons anchored in the Bay of Nombre de Dios in Panama, loaded up with gold and silver which had been carried thousands of miles by ship and by mule trains from the distant mountains of Peru and Bolivia. Nombre de Dios was only one example of the treasure ports that allowed the colonial powers to strip the indigenous empires of South America of their wealth and transport it home. Treasure Island, in obscuring the origin of the treasure, both through burial and the mixture of currencies, allows the hunters to claim it guiltlessly. As Lohman argues, 
These mystifications allow Trelawney's adventurers to enrich themselves in the Americas without having to participate directly in the sullying and morally compromising business of colonialism. Thus, Treasure Island contributes to the tradition of pirate, pirate stories that ignore the experience of groups that have been traditionally marginalized. Rather than forcing the hunters to accept their part in colonialism, it is the pirates who are depicted as the criminals for the theft of what are considered to be legitimately won spoils. In the words of Terry Eagleton, other people's imperialisms are more reprehensible than one's own. The pirates of Treasure Island are selfish, prone to bickering and unable to share, characterizing them as unmistakably, unmistakably infantile. During the novel's climax, Israel Hand, an experienced and supposedly very dangerous pirate based on the, the real-life um, uh, co-sailor who sailed with Blackbeard, is outwitted and then shot by the adolescent Jim Hawkins who's never set foot on a ship before. According to Kendra Marston, this is a deliberate way of representing the savage, typically employed to justify people's subject, subjection to colonization. These same tropes are employed with regards to Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. In these films, the pirate characters, particularly Jack Sparrow, Mr. Gibbs, and Barbosa, are engaged in what they perceive to be an, ide an ideological struggle for freedom against the tyrannical East India Company. Will Turner and Elizabeth Swan, both of whom are from economically privileged backgrounds, become embroiled in this struggle, eventually learning to sympathize with the plight of the pirates. However, all of them are white. By applying the idea of piracy as freedom to those for whom freedom is not really in question, Disney turns the East India Company into a stern parent figure trying to get the pirates to grow up. This turns the pirates into quasi-lost boy figures, children who refuse to grow up, rather than real human beings with legitimate complaints against the tyrannical colonial power. Moreover, while addressing the pirates, Barbosa says, Better were the days when mastery of the seas came not from bargains struck with eldritch creatures, Ooh. there's a picture of him, um, but from the sweat of a man's brow and the strength of his back alone. You all know this to be true. His language very clearly evokes images of slavery whilst erasing people of color from the narrative. Furthermore, Pirates of the Caribbean engages in a problematic erasure of black narratives in favor of what Marston calls the melancholic white woman story, where an initial state of gendered despair and powerlessness is overcome through the simultaneous discovery of feminism and an innate leadership charisma that allows the heroine to restore social cohesion to the fantasy zone. While stories of female emancipation are very important and necessary, in this particular trope, it happens at the expense of people of color and engages in a form of what Rosaldo calls imperial nostalgia, uh, whereby they mourn the passing of certain facets of empire while concealing the role of whiteness in such forms of domination. Stories about treasure, such as Treasure Island and the Curse of the Black Pearl, demonstrate this perfectly. They yearn for buried treasure whilst ignoring the fact that such treasure was earned through plundering native empires to enrich the European powers. This is more obvious in Pirates of the Caribbean where the treasure is explicitly Aztec, though the characters are never condemned for participating in the pillaging of a non-European treasure hoard. Moreover, these films engage in the ideological work with recourse to white hegemonic power structures, despite the presence of a supposedly ahistorical fantasy space. In other words, despite these films purporting to represent a utopian fantasy space in which Elizabeth is able to explore her innate charismatic feminist leadership, which is a direct product of her white bourgeois upbringing, they do so only insofar as it benefits Caucasian characters. Consider, for example, Tia Dolma, portrayed by Naomi Campbell, a voodoo priestess who is in fact the goddess Calypso in disguise, spoilers. Marston has convincingly argued that she's the wild counterpart to Elizabeth's civilizing influence, her story is entirely defined in relation to the white men around her, and she has never given the opportunity to explore her own agency. Pirates are used in this franchise to divert attention away from our colonial history by appropriating the experiences of ex-slaves and applying them exclusively to white pirate characters. Meanwhile, the Stars series Black Sails marks a significant departure from the majority of pirate texts. It is envisioned as a prequel to Treasure Island, but unlike its source text, it engages with issues of colonialism, race, and empire, forcing readers of Treasure Island to acknowledge the colonial context that Stevenson's original has tried to sweep under the rug. A particularly relevant example comes very early in the series, where they give the treasure back its history as Spanish plunder, and constantly utilize its origin as a plot point. For instance, when the Spanish colony at Havana insists that England take immediate and decisive action against the pirate haven of Nassau to recover their gold. <coughs> 
Unlike the majority of pirate texts, Black Sails does not shy away from the role of escaped slaves in piracy, but instead explicitly demonstrates that the pirates' fight against the injustices of colonial powers in Nassau only succeeded to the extent it did due to their alliance with the community of escaped slaves. It is interesting to note that Black Sails opted to subvert a common cinematic trope in the portrayal of black and white actors when on screen together. As noted by Marston in her discussion of Game of Thrones, Daenerys, of Game of Thrones Daenerys, film and television makers often choose to light white characters, particularly white women, in such a way as to make them appear luminous and ethereal, thus associating them with the divine. This plays out in one scene after Daenerys frees a group of slaves and they reach out towards her, her white blonde hair and blue costuming contrasting sharply with the thousands of brown arms that clamour to touch her. This, of course, is a highly distasteful trope. In Black Sails, however, this trope is reversed when Flint is brought before the Maroon Queen. At this point in the story, Flint has just survived being becalmed for several weeks and a one-on-one -on -one fight with the fearsome Black Blackbeard. He is therefore looking ragged, beaten up, which combined with Toby Stevens' customary feral snarl give him a somewhat savage appearance. The Queen, meanwhile, is elevated above him, with the sun shining from between the trees behind her to give the ethereal effect usually reserved for white women, and is upright, looking very dignified and regal. By reversing this problematic trope, Black Sails actively works against the colonial idea of civil empire versus the savage other. We're not likely to see a drop-off in interest in pirate culture anytime soon. Despite having released the fifth installment in Pirates of the Caribbean franchise only a few years ago, Disney have already announced that plans are underway to reboot it with new writers and a new cast. One need only stroll along the seafront of a town, any town on the coast of the UK, and they'll be confronted by any number of attractions inspired by piracy. Yet for all our fascination with pirates, we remain uncomfortable with certain historical facts. Pirate stories continue to end with a renunciation of piracy, leading to a return to the British Empire defined as a happy ending rather than force us to confront the truth of our colonial history or the fact that most pirates were simply arrested and hanged by the very same empire that would later nostalgically mourn their passing. Treasure Island and Pirates of the Caribbean both clearly and unapologetically participate in a tradition of diverting attention away from this colonial history. Black Sails, meanwhile, offers a more nuanced approach, attempting to reconcile historical truths about pirates with the sanitized narrative that has become commonly accepted. Sadly, however, for now at least, Captain Flint's musings seem accurate that we will all have been for nothing, defined by their histories, distorted to fit into their narratives, until all that is left of us is the monsters in the stories they tell their children. Thanks, Benji. So next we have Tio Rogers. Hi. Um, I have your, I'm sure I've seen your. No. I've heard Bruce Mann. There's Ben. Rogers. Yes. Do you want the clicker? Or um, well, you can use them. Hello, uh, I'm Taya Rogers from George Mason University in the, in the United States, close to Washington, D.C. Um, so the, the title of this paper is a direct quote from um, Samuel de Champlain from 1610. Um, so from this simple phrase, uh, the Basques are the cleverest men at this profession or at this fishing, um, and subsequent descriptions following the initial quote about the process of slaying the whale, we can infer Champlain's admiration for the Basque whalers. Occupational danger is a very common theme within whaling narratives, as it tends to present the whaler in a very macho way, especially if recounted by a non-whaler like Champlain who in the same block of text tells us about how the whale, when struck, goes to the bottom of the ocean, and if by chance in turning it strikes with its tail the shallop, which the, is the name of the whaling boat, or the man, it crushes them as, easy, as easily as a tumbler. He also describes the Nantucket sleigh ride, which is when harpooned whales swim as fast as a horse to use Champlain's analogy and drag the shallop behind them for leagues on end, um, 60 years before Nantucketers killed their first whale. Uh, he culminates with a graphic image of the whalers surrounding the weakened whale and with their halberds give it many thrusts until they kill it. A sad end for the whale, but not for the Basques, who prospered from thousands of scenarios like Champlain's episode for centuries. <laughs> 
Another noteworthy thing about Champlain's recollection of Basque whalers is the setting of the story. Uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, or Terra Nova, as it was then called by Europeans. It is, it is not a place one would normally associate with the Basques, but they were there, and if you were to believe some of the legends, they were there before anybody else. The earliest proposed date of discovery is 1372, according to A. Apat Echebarne. The earliest textual evidence of the Basques in or around Terra Nova dates to 1517, and this comes from advertisements in Bordeaux declaring cod cot in the Terra Novae, and a large whaling port had been established and was thriving by 1532 at Red Bay on coastal Labrador. Uh, regardless, both the English during Cabot's explorations at the very beginning of the 16th century and the Portuguese were already fishing the waters around Terra Nova for cod, another industry the Basques excelled at uh, by the time the Basques arrived. So why is it the Basques that were exalted and lauded as the discoverers of Terra Nova? Why does legend shroud, shroud the Basque whaling industry undoubtedly the best and only of its time, but not necessarily of mythic proportion? Another factor to consider before answering these questions in the mythologization of the Basque whalers is the larger context of what was happening in Europe at the time. The Dark Ages were coming to an end, and the Renaissance was beginning. One of the hallmarks of the early Renaissance was the, was the era of exploration that saw Europe's superpowers fund voyage after voyage across the seas and compete with each other over political, economic, and or religious dominion of discovered lands. Idealizations and romanticizations of each nation's causes led to what archaeologist slash anthropologist Brian Fagan calls nationalist myth-making. And this man here, um, Juan Sebastián Elcano, is a historical example of the pantheon of a Basque nationalistic mythology. And he was the first man to actually circumnavigate the globe because he was with Magellan's fleet, um, and he took over the fleet when Magellan was killed or died. Um, so he was the one that made it from port to port in Spain and Portugal. Um, sorry. Uh, here I should clarify that when I use myth before moving on, or mythology, I mean it not necessarily as a sacred narrative, although there are ele elements of this. I mean it in the policy makes sense of the aforementioned nationalist myth-making, um, blending history and folklore. Every mythology needs its heroes, and for the Basques, from both emic and etic perspectives, one of the heroes was the whaling industry. Of course, though, as is true of any corpus of legends, and I think especially true of legends centered on occupational groups, dialectics must be present to germinate dialogue over its veracity, as Linda Degg famously postulated. But the Basque whalers, or the legends about them, were never seriously questioned until centuries after the whaling industry collapsed. Only in the 20th century did scholars remark on the authenticity of the mid-millennium situation. Prominent Canadian historian Selma Barkham, quoted, quoted in Fagan's Fish on Friday, states that those cheerful fellows who chased whales further and further out into the Atlantic, those pioneer Basques who sailed up to Iceland and then on to Greenland in medieval times, accompanied by some obliging pilot, those men who miraculously bumped into Terra Nova and kept it secret, more than a hundred years before Cabot, those men are rather different from more mundane Basques who installed a flourishing and efficient whaling industry during the 16th century. Um, popular authors and scholars alike have been fooled by the legends. Why did this happen? Uh, why was there such longevity in the persistence of the Basque whaler mythos? Because if it simply was a product of nationalistic myth-making, then these legends would have been rejected by other nations. Does it tie into age-old perceptions and reverence toward the Basque whalers? Is it a product of the exploratory milieu of medieval and Renaissance Europe? And why does it make sense to be therefore mythologized within this zeitgeist? Um, so just, just to kind of get a picture of the kind of people that we're dealing with up on this, this first is what their boats would have looked like. This is a harpoon, not, with, not fully intact anymore. And this was their preferred target of choice, is the northern right whale, which they killed so many that um, it became colloquially, colloquially known as the Basque whale. Um, so um, Basque whalers were the first to exploit cetaceans commercially. 
When exactly they started doing so is less definitive. Extant evidence is scarce, but there is a document from 670 that confirms the sale of 40 pots of whale oil in northern France to illuminate an abbey sold by French Basques from Laborde. The main argument for this theory is that since somebody from so far away requested whale oil from the Basques, some kind of industry must have already been established. <clears throat> Whether this is indicative of a full-scale industry is contended, but it is a theory many scholars, such as Joseph Garat, um, Tom Tomas Ursainki, and Juan Maria de Olaizola hold. Others, like Alex Aguilar, prefer the earliest extant source that undeniably proves the industry's existence, a measure to concentrate whale meat in the Bayonne market from 1059. Regardless, the Basques on both sides of the Pyrenees had a booming industry by the late Middle Ages. Ports along the Cantabrian Sea and the Bay of Biscay dominated the markets until other European demographics, excepting the Norse, caught on. Unsurprisingly, they learned their skills from the Basques, not the Norse. Um, the other European markets would eventually learn from the Basques by um, taking Basque sailors with them on, on, whaling, on their earliest whaling ventures. Um, so hunting and killing the whale, going back to the early history, was a community affair, at least initially, before larger ships were built. Permanent watchmen scoured the sea for whale sightings, and those watchtowers are still um, in existence along the coast of Spain and France. Um, when the whale was spotted, the watchmen alerted waiting men on the beach, and a fleet of rowboats descended on the whale. They killed the whale much the same way that Champlain described and kept killing it that way for centuries. Um, the Basques perfected the art of whaling and demand for product was high. Aside from the standard oil and bone, whale meat was much in desire, particularly in the Catholic world, as meat obtained from the sea was considered cold meat and therefore acceptable to eat on holy days, which, as Kurlansky points out, made up about half the days on the calendar, including every Friday. Slabs of it were cut off and salted to make bacon, which the French served with peas and called crespois. By far the most exquisite part of the whale was its tongue, which was so valuable that the church demanded it as tithe payments and government officials as taxes, according to Fagan and Kurlansky. So the, the map on the left shows how far the Basques uh, got. And as you can see, well, I don't know if you can see or not, um, but they made it as far north as the Faroe Islands, and they um, got to the coast of Ireland. There were frequent visitors to Ireland and Scotland. Um, but most, most, most of it was confined to um, the northern coast of Spain. And then... Um, on the right here is the reconstruction of a whaling ship that was um, found wrecked off the coast of Newfoundland that a, a museum in, in San Sebastián is reconstructing using the same techniques and materials that would have been used in the 16th century, like down the line, so, which I really admire <laughs> their patience. Um, so the demand for Basque whale product was ever elevating and ships grew bigger and faster to accommodate the, necess the necessity for more cargo. Um, and as I explained, the image on the right is a photo of the building process of the San Juan being built using the 16th century techniques at the Albaola factory. Um, the Basques are excellent shipbuilders. As Mikel Barkham points out, it is, well it is a well-established fact that the provinces of Biscaya and Gipuzkoa formed the principal nucleus of Spanish naval construction in the 16th century and fostered this talent due to the centrality of the whaling industry um, to Basque culture and society. For most of its history, Basque whaling was mostly limited to the northern coast of Spain because um, despite the popular misconception, the right whale never went extinct off its waters. However, in the later Middle Ages slash early Renaissance, they often did fish on Irish and English waters following the right whale's northern migration, um, reaching as far as the Faroe Islands before the late 16th and early 17th centuries. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned before, the Basque whalers had a solid industrial foundation in Terra Nova by the 1530s. And the image on the left is an artistic illustration of that. Um, you can see 
there's a whale oven there and a whale being uh, stripped of blubber. Um, and the map in the center are, are Basque locations of where they would have been working in the whaling factories there. And uh, finally, these are some more permanent uh, um, materials found. They're uh, gravestones with Basque names on them written in the very unique Basque font. Um, it is possible, so it is possible that they were recruited to sail on English or Portuguese ships due to their maritime prowess. It is probable, though, that they were following the cod migration, not the cetacean migration. As some, Hux, as some Huxley explains, the right whale migration is from north to south, not east to west. So the theory of overfishing the Cantabrian Sea does not hold water. It took the Basque maritime industry until around 1530 to be convinced that traveling to Terra Nova at all was worth the expenditure. Overall, the benefits were worth the risks, although the storms, pirates, narratives, uh, sorry, Native Americans, and even other Basques, um, French for Spanish, were all hindrances to the industry. However, when Red Bay was thriving, Basque ships could return to the old world with as many as 2,000 barrels, each weighing about 400 pounds, or about 181 and a half kilograms of whale oil. Um, the reputation of the Basque whalers preceded them. For example, Jonas Poole, the first Englishman at Spitsbergen, north of Norway, probably the most significant location in whaling history prior to Nantucket, saw a great store of whales, but we could not catch them, for the Basques were then the only people who understood whaling. Other larger, richer, and more powerful nations, especially Great Britain and the Netherlands, gradually cultivated whaling prowess and amassed dozens strong fleets, eventually rendering their industrial progenitors and instructors um, the Basques useless, effectively eliminating their industry altogether. But their legacy remained, whether physically as archaeological remains, town names, etc., uh, linguistically or culturally. Um, coats of arms in the Spanish Basque country. Um, narratives, identity, heritage projects, etc. Um, both across the coastal Basque country and beyond, um, and particularly the recognition of Basque, ex Basque expertise and influence on whaling. And so these are some examples of the coats of arms, coats of arms in Spanish towns um, in the Basque country that depict whaling scenes. Um, so why is the preceding history important? Um, the relatively cursory summary, a knowledge of history is crucial in understanding the folklore of a region, or in this case, an industry, um, both within that culture and external perceptions of it, a stance that the likes of Richard Dorson advocated throughout his professional career. Much like the American folkloric figures that Dorson and his disciples studied, such as, such as frontiersmen, mountain men, soldiers, miners, etc. Um, Basque whalers were mythologized, a process closely linked with concepts of nationhood. Therefore, let us return now to what Fagan termed nationalist myth-making. Um, folklore and nationalism have been intertwined since the, since the inception of folklore as a serious scholarly pursuit within contexts of mythologizations, nationalistic folk heroes, historical or semi-historical alike are important and acting as a symbol. This involves an element of recreation corresponding with the needs of particular epics, as medievalist Shaban Brownlee explains, lending those mythologized figures to the interpretations of nationalist movements that appealed to patriotic sentiments. Occupational cultures comprised of the everyman figure, quite literally in the case of the Basque whalers, are often mythologized as these figure embody stereotypes of national culture. Um, Basque whalers were exemplary of this notion and, uh, and as is seen on the town crests, have represented coastal town identities and heritage since the medieval era. However, though this may explain why Basque whalers were exalted from their home regions, this still does not explain why Basque whalers were, Basque whale, whalers were mythologized across Europe. I believe that three factors explain this folkloristic phenomenon. The nature of the occupation is viewed by other Europeans, i.e. the intimidation and respect commanded by the whale, um, particularly during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. The exploratory fervor 
of the concurrent period in which other explorers and occupational groups were mythologized by nationalistic cultures and perceptions of the Basques as a secretive, isolated ancient peoples and combined with the two previous elements fostered longevity of narratives that portrayed the Basques as intrepid explorers, the original discoverers of the new world. So these are what um, most maps depicting whales showed. Um, and you get that here there be monsters from perceptions of whales that I'm, that I, that I'm about to explain right now. Um, so though medieval Europeans obviously knew of the economic importance of whales, there was in general an inherent fear in certain conceptualizations of the whale, which arose from the environment in which they resided, representing a strange realm from the point of view of humans. <coughs> and since the prey moves in a different medium, um, fishermen must make descriptive models of an environment about which they can only obtain information by indirect observation, as Polson hypothesizes. And biblical stories of Jonah and the Leviathan, as described in Job, um, hagiographic and apocryphal accounts of saints, and almost certainly personal legends of whales told by fishermen. Um, this led to the development of bestiary traditions in the medieval and Renaissance worlds where whales are depicted as monstrous. Vicky Sabo delves into this cultural phenomenon in great depth, framing her argument with a medieval description of the dangers of whale fishing from Alfric's colloquy from the 11th century. I prefer to catch a fish that I can kill rather than a fish that can sink or kill not only me, but also my companions with a single blow. Though Sabo acknowledges that there were more scientific examinations into the whale composed at the time. The general perception of the whale as a dangerous monster of immortal power, um, literally there are sources that imply that some cultures thought the whale's bones were imbibed with immortality, was pervasive enough to create a widely held cetacean-based folk belief across most of sea-going Europe. Um, apart from some Scandinavian cultures, who had some experience with the practicality of whales, um, nobody but the Basques knew not only how to kill them, but to significantly exploit them enough to develop a highly lucrative industry. Um, where the rest of Europe generally viewed the whale as you see on the screen, the Basques were already experts at killing them by at least the time um, that Alfred's colloquy was written, and, and very probably earlier than that. Um, therefore, it is natural to surmise that Europeans held the Basque whalers in great esteem. Um, from their perspective, the Basques were literally monster killers, mythical heroes a la Hercules, and nobody knew how they did it, as is evident from Jonas Poole's earlier quote. Um, perceptions of the Basques as heroes um, gave rise to exploratory legends that have persisted to this day. As I mentioned before, the farthest north that the, Basque, that the Basques ever reached was the Faroe Islands, not Iceland, as many sources from the Renaissance on have suggested. And the Basques, again, were not the first to reach Terra Nova in the late 14th century. Another common misconception about the Basque maritime industries was that they kept the locations of massive swaths of whales in the Strait of Belle Isle, um, which separates Newfoundland and, Newfoundland and Labrador a secret for a century, or that schools of cod so large one could step out of the boat and not get wet and line the Atlantic coast on the American side, another secret the Basques kept from all of the rest of seafaring Europe. Um, historical accuracy is not the arbiter to which legends adhere, though, and in the context of the exploratory milieu that had taken much of Europe by storm, that these legends um, prevailed over history conforms to the image of the mythologized um, heroic Basque whaler that simultaneously reflected stereotypes of national character and served as a symbol for larger European ventures makes sense. Though it is quite possibly true, a strong facet of Basque identity is derived from the belief that they are the oldest denizens of Europe, completely isolated physically by mountains and linguistically and generating mystery over the people and their origins. Um, many non-Basques hold and have held this belief too. It is nothing new, 
Um, several theories have been suggested and rejected about all things Basque, from Basques and non-Basques alike, leading to a higher susceptibility to latch onto attractive stories that reinforce Basque ideals of isolation, secrecy, and occupational resiliency slash mastery. Um, documents that echo these notions date back to the 1500s, written by usually French or Spanish amateur authors. In the 1800s, Jules Michelet's La Mer paints a picture of Mary Basque whalers braving the sea, doing God's work with each thrust of the harpoon, and discovering Terra Nova early on. A more recent example is the work of Mark Kurlansky, a popular author who, despite questioning aspects of the legends, affirms that the Basques were in Iceland in the 13th century, and that they might have been, and possibly were, but that there was no way of knowing concretely that the Basques reached Newfoundland before Cabot did. Thus, the mythologization process of the Basque whaler is permeated cross-culturally because, ethically, it evokes the mystery and ideals that the Basques embodied in their perception through a Basquephile lens, while emically these same nationalistic ideas, ideals portrayed their culture at its glimmering best. So therefore, Champlain decreed then, um, the, Basques, the Basques truly were the cleverest men at this profession, historically and folkloristically. Their legacy has survived through both mediums as well, in various ways, from textual formats to, co to coats of arms, to cultural memory and heritage. Um, however, the Basque whalers were mythologized beyond their, own, beyond their own cultural bounds because of their propensity for killing whales at a time in which that prey was thought of as immortal. Um, the exploratory milieu of the medieval and renaissance um, zeitgeist and, and emic and etic perceptions of the whalers that reinforced ideals such as um, cultural resiliency, mystery, and isolation. Um, some scholars have termed this mythologization as the Basque epic poetry, which to me seems as fitting an appellation as can be. Thank you. Next, the final one of the panel is Eilish Phillips, Cannibal Waters, Sailors and the Monstrous Maritime Space. There's a clicker, do you want it? Oh, a clicker. A clicker, oh, I know. Well, excitement. And there's a laser and oh, so it's... I'm going to do that cardinal sin, which is where I read the abstract as an introduction. <laughs> so I hope you haven't read it. <laughs> So this presentation explores the role played by the sea in transforming sailors from British subjects into cannibal monsters in 19th century narratives. Stories of cannibalism and exotic climes circulated frequently in the British press and literature. Research on these narratives largely focuses on indigenous cannibalism or acts of survival cannibalism as a result of shipwrecks. This act is described as a particular custom of the sea among sailors, which contributed to negative understandings of both sailors and of the sea itself. High profile contemporary cases such as the murder and devouring of cabin boy Richard Parker by the crew of the Mignonette in 1884 deeply troubled authors, leading them to ponder that men could be driven to such barbarity. Insufficiently discussed, however, is the role played by maritime waters in encounters with cannibalism. So my presentation today is going to analyse how sea spaces were implicated as catalysts for the transformation of sailors into cannibals. It argues that these sources created impressions of the sea as both a corrupting and infectious force, a transmission fluid through which foreign cannibal identities were communicated to British shores and subjects. Exploring these perceptions adds nuance, I think, to our understandings of the ways in which colonial, maritime, and environmental anxieties and identities were shaped and exposed by cannibal narratives during this period. So, in 1884, an author for the Gentleman's Magazine wrote that there, and I quote, was a certain attractiveness about the subject of can cannibalism, a grim fascination in its grisly horrors that is not easily to be explained, but which, although few of us would admit to it, most of us have experienced. So this quote reveals a Victorian taboo which the author seeks to exonerate at a time when cannibalism reporting was popular, spurred on by ghoulish tales of cannibal tribes abroad 
and survival cannibalism by Europeans in distress. The 19th century was arguably the era when cannibalism came home to British society. Formerly laughed off as rumours from faraway lands, colonial endeavours brought encounters with purported cannibal tribes into direct contact with colonisers. Such tales caused contagion fears, and the concept of cannibalism began to be discussed in vivid detail in newspaper and periodical reporting, both in terms of its supposed actuality among indigenous peoples, but also as a concept debated by elites at anthropological conventions. So, popular revulsion of acts of cannibalism during the 19th century as an impulse most frequently assumed by contemporaries to be found outside of Western civilization rather than within it appear the ultimate expression of buried guilt over the human cost of colonization. When Charles Dickens refuted claims that the explorer Sir John Franklin and his party engaged in survival cannibalism during their final expedition to the Northwest Passage, it was on the grounds that Franklin had resisted once before and that as he was a respectable gentleman, would rather die than be so debased. As Angus Eason argues, however, there is also a broader remit at work in Dickens' activism on behalf of Franklin's reputation which hints at the fear that the great European exploratory project had overextended itself. I quote Eason here, perhaps the extremity had been reached, perhaps the madman had broken forth, yet if there, why not also in English society? Why not also in Dickens himself? What Eason is expressing here is a fear that colonization was destabilizing British society, a fear exemplified in cannibalism narratives of the period. In particular, the fear that cannibalism could infect Western society. For if Westerners resorted to cannibalism, they could lay no claims to racial superiority over so-called cannibal tribes in the colonies. As James Marlowe states, and I quote, with these expressed differences gone, identity would disintegrate, and with a sense of identity would go the very meaning of life as the West had attempted to predicate it. Such a fear was even exploited by abolitionists in the 1790s in Britain in order to try and encourage the public to boycott slave-grown sugar. A popular pamphlet by William Fox circulated in 1791 declared blood, uh, sh sugar was, quote, steeped in the blood of our fellow creatures. For, as Aaron Pearson notes, blood sugar metaphors figured slaves and consumers not only in direct relation, but also in intimate contact. The fear of contamination by so-called blood sugar was not only an ethical concern, but also one of identity transformation. British consumers, already anxious about the ways in which their metabolism might be affected by the consumption of foreign foods, now feared morphing into the, and I quote, savage cannibals they had once fantasized about as existing only on the colonial periphery. Such anxieties were later to be capitalized on by the press, who began using the sensationalized title of cannibal in headlines to enliven otherwise ordinary cases of public aggression, such as barroom brawls. So when thinking about this anxiety that foreign foods carried cannibal contagions, I began to ponder the extent to which this was true also of sailors, as the men who ferried such goods and visited so-called cannibal lands themselves. At the heart of this new trend for British cannibal narratives, indeed, were mariners. They were the beings who had made contact with the exotic regions of the globe in which cannibalism was thought to flourish, such as Papua New Guinea, Fiji, or New Zealand. And I now want to turn to those narratives, exploring in turn accounts of foreign cannibalism, sailor cannibalism, and finally the role played by the sea as this uh, monstrous transmission fluid for such narratives. Okay, so. And in these slides here, I should point out that the indigenous peoples that are depicted, you can see for yourself, they're obviously as an extra layer of monstrosity physically depicted upon them that kind of gives them an almost demonic aspect. So it's sort of a, you know, a, a double othering. Um, and these are just some headlines that I found going through a Gale Primary Sources database um, from, you know, usually if you look in the Illustrated London News or, or uh, some of the kind of boys only style periodicals. Um, this intrigued me because of the headline below the hippo, a not unusual incident. Mm -hmm. Reports of cannibalism usually centred around shipwrecks. One particularly gruesome story about a shipwreck in Papua New Guinea 
circulated in several papers during 1859. According to Freeman's journal, a ship, the St. Paul, left Hong Kong for Sydney with 327 Chinese passengers and on the night of the 30th of September was totally wrecked on the island of Russell. Nine crew members, including the captain, took a boat and went in search of aid and were picked up by a passing schooner. Authorities at New Caledonia dispatched a steamship to ascertain what had become of the remaining passengers and brought back a horrifying story. The entire complement of passengers and crew had been killed by natives except one man who survived to give his account to the Sydney Morning Herald. After stealing their valuables, the natives apparently held the group captive, selecting them in batches to be roasted and eaten. The extract included from the Herald includes sensational details about this process, noting how the victims were cruelly beaten and eviscerated. A similar encounter again with natives of Papua New Guinea appeared in several papers in 1899, originally reported in the Daily Mail, some things never change. <laughs> the Mail's correspondent in Vancouver described the incident in lurid detail, again involving a ship bound for Sydney, shipwrecked on a Papua New Guinean shore. The crew were allegedly seized by natives, hurried into the interior and eaten. And I should note that I've cut out quite a lot of the, the gory details here because, you know, you've just had lunch. So, if you do want to hear more about it, you can ask me in the questions. But I thought, you know, I'll, I'll err on the side of caution and, uh, and remove those, but you'll have to just imagine the kind of very highly sensational, almost gothicized accounts. So, narratives which centered on instances of European cannibalism at sea were only slightly less orgiastic in their descriptions of the act. But here, the perception of cannibalism as a gleeful ritual is instead replaced with a vignette of desperation, sorrow, and insanity where indigenous cannibals were depicted as almost demonic figures who reveled in carnage, European seafarers who resorted to cannibalism were instead to be pitied. Such men, is assumed, it was assumed, only resorted to cannibalism as a last resort or during insanity. For them, cannibalism was purportedly a disease, not an inherent cultural taint. Charlotte M. Young, author of the book, uh, The Book of Golden Bees, okay, published in 1866, even used cannibalism as a yardstick with which to measure valour at sea. Comparing the conduct of British and French sailors in dire straits, she states, and I quote, after the loss of the French ship Medusa, brutal selfishness was followed by savage violence and cannibalism. In British ships of war, however, unshrinking obedience, heeding nothing but the one matter at hand, is the rule. Young then goes on to extol the virtues of British sailors, describing their chivalry and their grace under fire. As such, the French sailors, who obviously as historic rivals of the British, are othered as men whose lack of self-control leads them to cannibalism. And there's the price. The British Navy men are by contrast self-sacrificing heroes who refuse to be broken even in the face of death. So I should note here that I came across lots of French, or lots of depictions of French people as cannibals in the British press, and I wonder, does this have its roots, um, or certainly, is it influenced by French revolutionary narratives that depicted the French people resorting to cannibalism and drinking blood in the streets, and um, all very much negative propaganda. So moving on. In spite of Young's bucolic accounts of British sailors, reports of Britons resorting to acts of cannibalism did indeed surface in the press. As mentioned, the infamous case of the crew of the shipwrecked Mignonette, who resorted to killing and consuming their cabin boy, garnered many headlines during the 1880s. Authors debated the extent to which the two men, or sorry, yeah, the men charged, Dudley and Stevens, were guilty of murder. Cannibalism was not and is not a legal defence in and of itself. Of the media furores, the Leeds Times noted, and I quote, the great question of the hour is not what is to be done with Egypt or the peers, but under what circumstances are we justified in having a boy for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> While the Mignonette incident dominated cannibal discussions during 1884, other stories ebbed and flowed of sailors resorting to cannibalism. While some of these related to shipwreck scenarios, a transition occurred in the press during the latter decades of the century in which otherwise um, ordinary acts of biting assault started to be reported as cannibalism. When 22-year-old American sailor was tried for biting open another sailor's chin on London's infamous Ratcliffe Highway, the magistrate remarked, and I quote, 
it would almost appear as if the prisoner were a sort of cannibal. He was certainly more like a wild beast than a human being. In 1878, a British sailor was tried at the Thames Police Court for biting off half a man's ear. The Tamworth Herald reported on the trial under the sensational, if minimalist, headline, A Cannibal. When a Welsh sailor was charged in 1870 with biting off part of a man's nose and a piece of his face, the conversation between presiding officials was reported as follows. You have to imagine I have a deep voice with lots of gravitas, so I do these voices. Mr. Orme, has the nose been found? McGee, it has not. Mr. Orme, why, this fellow must have swallowed it. Mr. Shields, he's nothing but a Welsh cannibal. Mr. Shields is the prosecuting attorney, clearly, clearly using the cannibal identity as a means to infer a monstrous criminality on the part of the defendant. So while these accounts are interesting, they don't give much of a sense of the wider cultural reception of the white cannibal trope. For this, we can turn to a more illustrative story published in various newspapers, including the Portsmouth Evening News and the Pall Mall Gazette in 1883. Entitled The Story of an English Cannibal, and here's part of it here, the reports focused on the tale of Arthur Gamblehart, described as a wolfish looking English sailor. I really love this story. I love his name as well, Gamblehart. <laughs> so it makes, makes me wonder if it's fictional, because I think, oh, what a fantastic name. Um, Gamblehart, whether real or fictional, was born in Deal on the south coast. In 1876, he shipped aboard a bark called the Whistlesea, departing Portsmouth from Melbourne with a complement of 19 men and general goods. After encountering a hurricane round the Cape of Good Hope, Gamblehart was forced to take command when the captain was washed overboard. Efforts to save the ship were futile, and she sank along with all hands, save Gandalhart and four others who escaped in a boat. Two men would later jump overboard. They drunk seawater. And on the fourth night, one of the remaining men, a Swede, became deathly ill. Later that day, the man died, and Gandalhart and his companion feasted on his flesh. And Gandalhart stated, To realise my position, you must have been through a like experience yourself. Our lives were saved, but at what cost? Even now, my flesh creeps when I think of our life during the next three days. The survivors were picked up on a steamer on the seventh day of drifting and taken back to Plymouth. The experience traumatised Gandalhart for life, who noted recurring nightmares about the incident and said, The men shun me and I cannot live an endurable life in any ship that sails. I shall go back to Deal and get in the fishing trade again. The folks all know me there and pity my misfortunes instead of condemning me for doing that which I could not help. In this narrative, even though the British sailor Gandalhart has not committed murder, he is still shunned by his fellow men for the act of cannibalism. Here the cultural taboo is powerful, even among other sailors who knew of cannibalism as a pre-extant so-called custom of the sea. Evidently, Gandalhart's sad tale, whether truth or fiction, is designed to elicit empathy for sailors of European descent and to exonerate them at a time when non-Europeans were being heavily othered for what were described as more ritualistic acts abroad. And now we get to my favourite aspect, which is monstrous fictions of the environment, which is what my PhD is on. So uh, and I, yeah, I've taken liberties with this gentleman on the, uh, the far right here, but I just couldn't resist. <laughs> Finally, I want to explore an added layer to the monstrosity of the sailor cannibal, and that of their connection to the sea. While maritime spaces are frequently the subject of magical and romantic depictions, plenty of narratives abound which discuss the sea as a monstrous space, almost possessive of a malevolent sentience. An author for the Northern Star newspaper wrote, of stormy waters off the coast of Arthur Gandalhart's hometown of Deal. And I quote, the state of things had drawn together crowds of people to witness the heavy surges as they rolled in one after the other, revealing their monstrous curled heads as though they would destroy the town itself. In 1890, the Sheffield Daily Telegraph pub published a vivid editorial piece which insinuated the hostile monstrosity of the ocean played a part in sailor cannibalism. The author described recent stormy weather conditions on the Atlantic in very evocative terms. And I quote again, The clouds have been rent in tatters, the crests of the waves torn off and blown along in midair by winds which literally shrieked until the hardiest of mariners held his breath, appalled at the unearthliness of such piercing sounds. 
The melancholy sea, that wilderness of water, had been heaved up in walls like ranges, curling their monstrous and menacing heads, until each hollow was a darkening abyss, a veritable vallow, vallow, ugh, valley of the shadow of death, with winds so weirdly wild in the shriekings that the noises seemed demonical. I'll put my teeth back in. <laughs> the author complained of modern ships not properly built to withstand such monstrous elements, calling them, I quote, dead ships, manned with dead men, drift, uh, drifting upon a sailor's sea. On these so-called skeleton ships, these floating horrors of the deep, scenes more fearful have been found. The living have been driven to cut the throats of the dying to drink their blood or had gnawed and eaten the raw flesh of the dead. In this source, while some blame is placed upon inadequate shipbuilding and loading, the monstrous identity which is created for the sea itself is one which bears the ultimate burden of responsibility. Where the sea not so hostile or so merciless as space, then the sailor need not fear becoming susceptible to this cannibal contagion. So in conclusion, I should note that from the mid-19th century onwards, cannibal identities have also infected the urban population at large. In 1865, when a woman was charged with biting off another woman's lower lip, the Illustrated London News remarked that, I quote, the virago was known in the neighbourhood as the fiend, and her fiendish deed was done with malice and repentance. And making a comparison of the behaviour of the British woman with notions of the South Sea, or South sea cannibalism, the author notes, the fiend was not a Fiji, but a cannibal residing within the Metropolitan Police District. <laughs> Thus, in this latter half of the century, stories of cannibalism from tropical regions had begun to infect news reporting about British sailors and British criminals. Race, class, and occupational dimensions operated in cannibal narratives to determine how much sympathy and mercy were to be awarded to those portrayed as such by the media. By far and away the most important factor in determining the extent to which the cannibal would be vilified was their race and location. Europeans who found themselves lost in foreign environments were most likely to receive understanding and pity. When elite explorers such as Sir John Franklin and his expeditionary force were posthumously accused of cannibalism when trying to survive Arctic conditions, notable figures such as Charles Dickens went to great lengths to exonerate their names. Dudley and Stevens of the Minionette, while not receiving as much effort in this regard, um, still received a fair amount of support, particularly due to their committing the act while adrift at sea. Sailors who committed lesser acts of biting enjoyed briefer fame, but were othered as monsters to a greater extent than those others who were deemed to have fallen into depravity in service of the cause of British trade or exploration. Finally, the ordinary land-bound urban peasantry were most vilified. Again, even when the crime was merely biting as opposed to deliberate flesh ingestion, um, and these rarely led to murder. Non-Europeans, of course, uh, were the most othered figures in these narratives. And uh, before I continue, I should say that when I'm talking about this hierarchy, obviously, uh, thinking about, say, French or Nordic sailors, they were slightly more likely to be uh, othered in accounts than, say, the British were. So they might get a bit a bit more of a short shrift than British explorers, but I think that's, but you could call it home bias. But, um, but yeah, so non-Europeans were sadly the people who are most likely to be depicted as monstrous and were given the least empathy in these narratives. And stories of their barbarity and savage rituals seemed to haunt all other depictions of cannibalism during this period. It was these legends about indigenous cannibals combined with narratives of the sea as a monstrous conduit for such propensities, which greatly influenced portrayals of the European sailor as a carrier of the infectious cannibal appetite. Thank you very much.